Okay, let's unpack this. We're diving into the heart of two major UK government schemes. The energy company obligation, you know, ECO. And the Great British Insulation Scheme, GBIS. Exactly. And these were set up with really critical goals, right? Tackling fuel poverty, cutting carbon emissions, basically insulating homes across the country. The idea was to really help consumers. That's absolutely right. The intention, uh, the premise was excellent on paper. But what we're really looking at today using the National Audit Office, the NAO's findings, is how this huge system designed to guarantee quality and keep people safe ended up with just widespread installation failures. And suspected fraud, too, which is another layer. A significant layer, yes. So our mission today is to understand how a system that was supposed to have quality assurance baked in could fail so spectacularly. And the scale of this failure, I mean, that's where we have to start. It's almost hard to wrap your head around these numbers, but they're right here in the source material. And these schemes, they were funded by our energy bills. Yes, that's right. You and I, everyone paying an energy bill contributes. Okay. For a typical bill, it's roughly $198 a year going towards funding these specific schemes. And in return, what was the promise? Well, big savings. Households were promised you know, potentially up to 450 pounds a year off their bills for ECO4, maybe 230 pounds under GBIS, huge incentives. Good. But the NAO looked at installations done before January 16th, 2025. Yeah. And the results. They suggest that for some types of insulation, the whole system has failed on a, well, almost a universal level. Okay, give us those headline figures, the really shocking ones. Right, let's start with external wall insulation, EWI. That's the insulation you put on the outside of a house. Mm -hmm. The NAO estimates that a devastating 98% of homes with this type of insulation have major issues, issues needing expensive fixes. 98%. 98%. We're talking about somewhere between 22,000 and 23,000 households. That's, that's not a failure rate. That sounds more like the system itself was the failure? It's incredibly stark, and we need to be clear about how serious these issues are. Within that 98%, about 6% of those homes had immediate high-priority health and safety risks. Wow. And while EWI was clearly the worst offender, internal wall insulation, IWI, also had really serious problems. What were the numbers there? For IWI, it's estimated that 29% of homes have major issues. That affects somewhere between 9,000 and 13,000 properties. Still a huge number. Okay, so when we say major issues, that 98% for the external stuff, what does that actually mean for the person living in that house? Is it just like, it looks bad? Or is it genuinely dangerous? No, these are serious performance affecting issues. For that 98% EWI failure rate, in 92% of those cases, the problems compromise the insulation's performance. They risk water getting in. Which leads to damp and mold. Exactly. Damp, black mold. And those immediate health and safety risks we mentioned, that 6%, things like inadequate ventilation. Which is a massive problem, right? Especially if you're sealing up a house to insulate it. You mm -hmm. absolutely need proper ventilation. Otherwise, you risk carbon monoxide buildup, other hazards. Precisely. And for the IWI failures, the internal insulation, 27% risk performance. So things like internal condensation, mold again. Mm -hmm. But the health and safety risks there, which were about 2% of the IWI failures, involve things like poor electrical safety. Oh, wow. And again, inadequate ventilation. And it's important to note, this isn't just an eco and GBIS problem. Audits across other government schemes, like the was for social housing, also found thousands of homes, maybe 6,500 or so, with similar major systemic problems needing remediation. The human cost is just, mm -hmm. it's huge. When you read the stories from people calling the Ofgem helpline, these abstract numbers become really horrifying realities. They do. People reporting getting electric shocks from their walls because safety features like cutoff switches had apparently been bypassed by the installers. Deliberately bypassed, in some cases reported. We saw reports where an independent electrician looked at the work in one house and flat out called it a fire risk. A fire risk? Yeah. These schemes were meant to save families money, give them warm, safe homes. But instead, some people ended up with, and this is a quote, unheatable, moldy houses. That's the ultimate betrayal, isn't it? Something designed to lift people out of fuel poverty actually leaves them in dangerous, maybe even unlivable conditions. And the cost to fix it can be just astronomical. It absolutely can. I mean, typically fixing bad EWI might cost between, say, 5,000 and 18,000 pounds. Which is already a lot. Oh, already a lot. But Trustmark, that's the quality assurance body, they investigated one case, probably the most extreme they'd ever seen, where the insulation was so badly done it caused catastrophic dam, mold, rot, the whole works. The cost to fix it, over 250,000 pounds, including VAT. A quarter of a million pounds. 
to fix insulation that was supposed to save maybe a few hundred pounds a year on bills, that just, mm. it leads straight to the question of accountability, doesn't it? It does. With this level of failure, potentially 35,000 homes affected, you'd think fixing it would be top priority. But the remediation is moving incredibly slowly. Painfully slowly. Yeah. As of mid-September 2025, less than 10% of the homes identified with major issues had actually been fully fixed. That's only about 2,934 homes out of an estimated 31,900 to 35,300. Less than 10%. Yeah. And that slow pace points directly to the really thorny liability question. Who actually pays to clean up this mess? Right. Who is supposed to be liable? What does the system say? Well, legally, the original installer is liable for all the remediation costs. Okay. And if that installer, you know, goes bust or disappears, mm -hmm. the system has a 25-year guarantee that's meant to cover the cost. But there's a catch. There's a big catch. It only covers costs up to a maximum of 20,000 pounds per installation. Ah. And there's the gap. If you've got cases costing 250,000 pounds, that 20,000 pounds guarantee barely scratches the surface. Yeah. The government department, DESNZ, Energy Security, and Net Zero, They've said no household should have to pay. But have they actually said how costs above that 20,000 pound guarantee limit will be covered, especially in those really awful, exceptional cases? That's the problem. They haven't clarified that crucial point. And that lack of clarity, you can imagine, causes huge stress for homeowners. I bet. And are the installers even cooperating? Not always. We're seeing resistance. The report mentions 225 installers who had over 1,500 projects where the fix was taking longer than the target 12 weeks. And what about companies just folding to avoid paying? That's a real concern, too. The issue of phoenixing, where directors closed down a company with liabilities and then immediately start a new, similar one. The NAO noted that 27 retrofit businesses that had outstanding remediation work were actually no longer registered with Trustmark, the quality scheme. They had essentially vanished from the system's oversight. It just sounds like a complete failure of oversight, not just individual bad jobs. Looking at how this whole thing was managed, it seems incredibly complicated. Oh, the complexity is absolutely key to the systemic failure. Mm -hmm. You've got DESNZ, the government department, setting the overall policy. Right. Then you have Ofgem, the yep. energy regulator, managing the day-to-day -day administration of the scheme. Okay. Then Trustmark acts as the quality assurance scheme, setting the standards installers have to meet. Still with you. Then UK's, the UK's national accreditation body, they accredit the organizations the certification bodies who actually go out and do the checks on the installers. Right, okay. And finally, you have the scheme providers and the energy suppliers who are responsible for funding the whole operation through those levies on our bills. Wow, that is, that's a dizzying list of acronyms and organizations. If you're a homeowner with a problem, how on earth do you even figure out who you're supposed to talk to? That's precisely the issue. And the NAO report captures the fatal flaw perfectly. They said, and I quote, Nobody we spoke to could give a comprehensive explanation of how the system was meant to work. Nobody they spoke to, including people running the scheme. Apparently so. When the people involved in operating the system can't actually explain the lines of authority and responsibility clearly. Well, failure is almost inevitable, isn't it? it that quote is just devastating. It points to a fundamentally broken structure from the outset. So let's dig into those root causes DESNZ themselves identified. Why was it designed so poorly that it just didn't spot a 98% failure rate for years? Well, a primary cause seems to be limited government oversight. Yeah. DESNZ made a conscious decision early on to design the system so it operated at arm's length. Meaning? Meaning they held the overall policy responsibility, but they deliberately limited their direct day-to-day -day influence. They also lacked crucial technical expertise within the department itself. Okay. And it seems senior leadership attention was yeah. bill limited, which led them, tragically, it seemed, to just assume the system was working okay. They didn't really check the data rigorously enough. An assumption. That's incredible. And that assumption had real-world consequences for the body that was supposed to be checking quality Trustmark. Absolutely. Trustmark's funding model really hampered its ability to be an effective watchdog. It was funded mainly by this very small 45 vial off lodgement fee for each installation registered. 45 pounds? That seems tiny. It is tiny. And that limited cash flow combined with loan repayments they had meant they just couldn't afford to invest properly in developing the kind of sophisticated data analysis tools they needed. Tools that could spot trends, 
identify high-risk installers, flag non-compliance quickly. And those crucial data systems weren't ready? They weren't fully operational until late 2024. That's three years after Trustmark took over technical monitoring responsibilities. So the poor funding basically stopped proper surveillance, Ooh. which effectively let installers game the system. Pretty much, yes. Yeah. The standards themselves only required the certification bodies, the ones doing the checks, to audit a small percentage of installations, typically somewhere between 3% and 10%. Only 3 to 10%. Yes. And installers quickly learned how to exploit this. They could apparently underreport the number of installations they were doing, or even switch between different certification bodies. That allowed some to drive their overall audit rate right down to the lowest end of the range, maybe just 3% or 4%. Okay, hold on. That seems like the core conflict right there. If you only audit maybe 3% of jobs, but it turns out that 98% of the work for one measure is actually failing. Wasn't the system basically designed to invite exploitation, to let installers get away with shoddy work? It certainly looks like a massive, inherent vulnerability. A clear invitation, perhaps unintended, but an invitation nonetheless. And this catastrophic failure in quality oversight didn't just lead to bad insulation. Yeah. It also created a huge opportunity for outright fraud. Right. The second major issue here, suspected criminal activity actually costing the public, us, money. How big are the estimates for fraud? Objim estimates that somewhere between 56 million and 165 million might have been fraudulently claimed. Wow. That relates to potentially 5,600 to 16,500 homes. The kinds of fraud suspected include things like manipulating the energy efficiency savings calculations to get bigger payments, okay. claiming for work on properties that weren't actually eligible for this game in the first place, and even, in some cases, the installations being linked to wider criminal activity. And the way the system was set up with the commercial incentives, that just made things worse, didn't it? Installers obviously wanted to maximize their payments, get the highest efficiency scores, while keeping their own costs as low as possible. That's the inherent tension, yes. And the system relies very heavily on the role of someone called the retrofit coordinator. There's supposed to be an independent check on quality before the installation gets signed off. It's supposed to be independent, but... But often, the retrofit coordinator is actually contracted by or even directly employed by the installer themselves. Hang on. That sounds like a massive conflict of interest. If the person checking the quality is paid by the person doing the work, where's the independence? That completely removes the segregation of duties, doesn't it? It fundamentally undermines that control, yes. It creates a broken check in the system. Yeah. And compounding all this, DESNZ apparently failed to carry out a proper, comprehensive fraud risk assessment right at the start of the ECO4 and GBIS schemes. They didn't even assess the risk. Not comprehensively at the outset, it seems. And while Ofgem technically relies on the energy suppliers, Trustmark, and others to spot fraud, those organizations have very limited requirements and, frankly, not much incentive to proactively hunt for fraud once a project is finished and the money's already been paid out. It sounds like a perfect storm of poor design, lack of oversight, misaligned incentives, and missed opportunities to catch problems early. So when we boil it all down, what's the ultimate lesson here? What should we, and crucially the government, take away from this whole fiasco? I think the key takeaway, the really sobering lesson from the NAO report, is that these failures, they aren't actually new, unfortunately. We saw similar problems, similar breakdowns in previous government energy efficiency schemes, like the Green Homes Grant Voucher Scheme, that was also criticized for being overly complex. Yeah. So it's a pattern. It seems to be a recurring pattern, yes. The common theme is clear. When the government sets up these massive consumer-funded schemes but then tries to operate them at arm's length, the system ends up lacking clear, ultimate government accountability. The roles and responsibilities of all the different players become blurred and confusing. And crucially, the quality assurance and audit parts of the system are starved of the resources and the clout they need to actually work effectively. Has DSNZ done anything since this report came out? Yes, they have taken some steps. They've appointed a senior responsible owner specifically tasked with sorting out these issues. They've also suspended, and in some cases then reinstated, some of the worst performing installers once they fix their outstanding projects. Okay, so some action is being taken, but the real test is what happens next, right? Especially with the government's upcoming Warm Homes plan, they have to apply these lessons. Absolutely. The learning from this must translate into a dramatically different, much more robust system for the future. Anything less would be unacceptable. And I suppose that brings us to the final, really crucial question for you, the listener, to think about as we wrap up this deep dive. 
We've heard that the bodies responsible for checking quality of the certification bodies, they only audit somewhere between 3% and 10% of installations. Yet we also learned that for one key measure, external wall insulation, 98% virtually all installations had major failings. So the question has to be, how should DESNZ redefine what acceptable risk even means in their new schemes? How can they possibly assure the public, assure us, that relying on such a low single digit audit rate will be enough next time? How will they stop installing gaming the system and putting public safety and billions of pounds of our money at risk all over again. That fundamental conflict between that tiny audit percentage and that massive failure rate, surely that has to be resolved head on.